Welcome to the Deep Dive, where we cut through the noise and get straight to the insights you need. Glad to be diving in. Today, we're embarking on, well, a really critical deep dive. We're looking at an often underestimated issue. Which is? The significant and, frankly, growing health challenges faced by India's elderly population. Mm -hmm. Our mission today is to sort of pull back the layers on these multifaceted issues. And crucially. And crucially, yeah, uncover these surprisingly comprehensive and uh, innovative solutions India's putting in place. What's particularly striking here, I think, is just the sheer scale of the demographic shift we're about to explore. It's huge. It is. It's not just a numbers game. It's, you know, profound societal transformation. Right. And as we dig in, you'll hear us talk about something called the double burden of disease. Okay. The double burden. Yeah. It offers a really powerful lens, I think, into the unique complexities developing nations like India face when caring for their aging citizens. Okay. Let's unpack that demographic shift then. So when we talk about the elderly in India... Who are we talking about, definition-wise? Our sources define them as individuals over 60 years old. Simple enough. Right. But this isn't some, you know, distant future thing. It's happening right now. The numbers are climbing fast. Exactly. Picture this. Back in 2010, they were about 8% of India's population. Oh. By 2050, that's projected to nearly double. We're talking 19% of the total population. Wow, 19%. To put that in perspective, that 19%, it'll actually exceed the entire U.S. population back in 2012. That really drives home the scale. It does. And this isn't just some fascinating statistic, right? It's a colossal shift. With immediate consequences. Immediately places an immense strain on existing health services. It demands a truly robust and, frankly, rapid response. And that's exactly where that double burden concept comes in, connecting to the bigger picture. Right. Explain that a bit more. Well, it isn't just about more elderly people. It's about the uh, unique health landscape they inhabit. See, unlike many industrialized nations that you know, largely moved past widespread infectious diseases decades ago. Like TB, things like that. Exactly. India is grappling simultaneously with those persistent communicable diseases. Think tuberculosis, bacterial pneumonia, often linked to poverty, sanitation issues. Still a major factor. A very major factor. And at the same time, there's this rapidly rising tide of non-communicable diseases. Like heart disease, diabetes. Precisely. Diabetes, heart conditions, certain cancers things typically associated with aging and changing lifestyles. So both kinds of problems hitting at once. Both crises at once. Mm. And the challenge is immense because they're managing this often without the deep established resources that wealthier nations might have. That makes sense. So what does this actually mean for the individuals, you know, the people living through this? Yeah, the human impact. The health problems are incredibly multifaceted, aren't they? They reach far beyond just the physical side of things. Absolutely. Our sources highlight a whole spectrum of challenges. Let's maybe start with the socioeconomic and psychological hurdles, because these seem to really underpin so much of the experience of aging. They do. There's the harsh reality for many of poverty mm -hmm. and with it, feelings of isolation, even neglect sometimes. It's a sad truth, isn't it, that modern society really globally can sometimes view the elderly as, well, a liability. Instead of a source of wisdom and experience. Yeah. And this perception, it can lead to profound mental and emotional changes. Like what specifically? Well, we're talking about things like impaired memory, maybe a certain rigidity of outlook, a natural dislike of change, perhaps. Things that can be exacerbated by the stresses of aging. Totally. And then you factor in a reduced income, which hits their living standard. Compounding the problem. Exactly. And emotionally, uh, many experience what our sources call social maladjustment. Which it can look like. Bitterness, withdrawal, deep depression, mm -hmm. and in some tragic cases, even suicidal thoughts. That's incredibly serious. It is. The sources also touch on um, challenges in sexual adjustment in later life. Which isn't often talked about. No, but it can contribute to things like irritability, jealousy, despondency. It reminds you that human needs and complexities, they persist through every stage of life. And what's profoundly insightful here, I think, is the explicit mention of the family's role. Ah, yes, the family unit. Our sources describe the family as a kind of shock absorber against life's stresses. A buffer. Exactly. A vital unit providing essential care, emotional, practical support that even the best medical care just can't fully replicate. Yeah, that makes total sense. But, you know, as India urbanizes and family structures change. From extended to smaller nuclear units. Right. It does raise a critical question. How much pressure does this put on individual families? 
It's a cultural strength, definitely, but also potentially a growing societal challenge. That's a really powerful point about the family as a cultural anchor. And while that social support is invaluable, it also highlights the sheer weight of physical health issues families and the healthcare system are grappling with. Beyond the crucial social emotional aspects, yeah. India's elderly face the significant array of degenerative and chronic diseases. Let's get into some specifics. Okay, cardiovascular diseases, for instance. Very high prevalence. Common conditions like hypertension, high blood pressure. Very common. Heart conditions from blocked arteries, actual heart failure. And then there's atherosclerosis. Which is? Where artery walls thicken, harden, diminishing blood supply. It gets more common after age 40. Right. And metabolic disorders. Also a major concern. Things like diabetes, thyroid diseases, and get this statistic. Okay. About 75% of diabetics in India are over 50 years old. 75%. That's staggering. It really is. It points to a massive public health challenge needing targeted prevention for this vulnerable group. Well, that's musculoskeletal issues. Yes, another big source of discomfort, disability. Osteoporosis, fragile bones. Leading to fractures. Exactly. Osteoarthritis, that debilitating joint inflammation. Our sources specifically mention fractures of the neck of the femur, often from simple falls because the bones are fragile. Which can be devastating. Absolutely life-altering. Then on the neurological front, conditions like dementia, Alzheimer's, they're growing concerns. And sensory impairments. Also common. Things like senile cataract, glaucoma, nerve deafness, all clearly linked to aging. Okay. And we can't forget common respiratory illnesses. Bacterial pneumonia, TB is still there, asthma, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, makes breathing hard. Right. Cancers too, I imagine. Cancers are a leading cause of death in later life, yes. As are gastrointestinal problems like peptic ulcers and genitourinary issues. Prostate enlargement is a common one. It's a long list. It is. And speaking of falls earlier, mm -hmm. we absolutely cannot overlook accidents. Especially in the home. Especially in the home, yeah. Because of that increased fragility of bones, these incidents can just have devastating consequences. You know, the cumulative effect of all these challenges is what really demands attention. It's not just one thing. No, it's often this complex interplay, right? It mm -hmm. compounds the burden on the individual, their family, the whole healthcare system. Mental health, chronic physical issues, accidents. The sheer breadth of these issues really underscores why a holistic integrated response isn't just helpful, it's absolutely essential. So, okay. The challenges are clear, they're immense, they often intersect. But here's where the narrative takes a, well, a hopeful turn. The response. Exactly. India isn't just watching these problems unfold. Our sources show a remarkable, proactive counteroffensive, really. A comprehensive suite of policies and programs. Truly comprehensive. Implemented by the government of India to tackle these issues head on. It's quite an impressive display of national commitment, actually. Where does it start? Foundational policies. Yeah, let's start there. Foundational policies, financial safety nets, trying to provide a basic quality of life. Like the national policy on older persons. That's a key one. Established way back in 1999, it set a clear aim. Yeah. Improve quality of life across different areas. Financial security, healthcare, nutrition, shelter, protection. A broad scope. Very broad. It even actively encourages self-help groups for older persons, which fosters community and mutual support. And financial support. Pensions. Crucial. The National Social Assistance Program provides vital old age pensions. We're talking over 4 million destitute elderly nationwide getting support. Wow. A key part is the Indira Gandhi National Old Age Pension Scheme, launched in 2007 offers a monthly pension specifically for those over 65 living below the poverty line. A critical safety net. Provides a crucial financial cushion, yeah, especially for the most vulnerable. Okay, so that's the foundation. Right. What about healthcare access itself? Insurance. Right. Moving on to healthcare access, several important insurance provisions are mentioned. Smaller schemes first. Schemes like Pavisha Regia Mediclaim, rural group life insurance designed to provide some coverage. But the big ones. Then you have the truly large-scale government initiatives. Real game changers. Ayushman Harat Pratan Mantri Jan Arogya Yujana. ABPMJAY. Heard a lot about that. It's massive. Offers health insurance cover up to 5 lakh rupees per family per year per family, per year. For secondary and tertiary hospitalizations, aimed at poor and vulnerable families, so it significantly benefits elderly members. And what does it cover? Pre and post hospitalization care, drugs, diagnostics, makes healthcare far more accessible, 
reduces that risk of catastrophic out-of-pocket expenses. Which can cripple families. Absolutely. And for specific groups, there are also schemes like ESI, the Employees State Insurance Scheme for Organized Sector Workers, right. and CGHS, the Central Government Health Scheme for Government Employees and Pensioners. You know, the sheer ambition behind these financial safety nets and health insurance schemes is just remarkable. It really is. These aren't just small tweaks. They represent a fundamental shift towards ensuring basic dignity and access to care for millions. Alleviating that financial stress. Exactly. Which, for many elderly individuals, could otherwise be absolutely crippling. These programs directly support that idea of aging with economic security. A major global challenge. That's a crucial point. And beyond the financial aid, a really vital part of India's integrated approach is delivering health services through these health and wellness centers, HWCs. Right, down at the community level. Exactly. The revised Indian public health standards now explicitly include elderly and palliative health care services as a core offering right there. So it's baked into the system. It is. HWCs are central to mobilizing communities, promotion, prevention, rehabilitation aspects of elderly health. And awareness, too. Vital role in raising community awareness about social security schemes, addressing critical issues like elder abuse through family counseling. Building community support. Plus, actively promoting healthy behaviors and intergenerational bonding, really fostering that sense of community. What's truly innovative here, I think, is the proactive element built into this HWC model. The screening. Yes. Our sources highlight comprehensive geriatric assessments conducted twice a year by community health officers, CHOs. Twice a year? That's frequent. It is. And it's not just waiting for illness to strike. It's actively screening for potential issues. Like cognitive decline, mobility issues. Cognitive decline, limited mobility, malnutrition, sensory impairments, depressive symptoms. Finding these early insurers early intervention. Which can make a huge difference. A world of difference. Right. And it raises an important question for all healthcare systems, right? How many proactively assess for these age-related conditions so systematically? Good question. And furthermore, you have the ASHAs, the accredited social health activists. The village level workers. Playing a critical role right there, acting as essential links between beneficiaries and services, making sure people actually get the care they need. That proactive screening done right at the community level by CHOs linked by AARs, yeah. that really does sound like a potential game changer. It's a strong model. And beyond these general health services, there are also targeted disease management and prevention strategies in place too, right? Yes, specific programs. Mm. For instance, the National Health Policy 2017 set some ambitious goals. Such as? Like achieving 80% controlled status for known hypertensive and diabetic individuals by 2025. That directly targets major issues for the elderly directly benefits them as they're disproportionately affected. There are also specific programs for controlling blindness. Cataracts, glaucoma. Management of cataracts, glaucoma, diabetic retinopathy, all very common in older age. And mental health. Mental health services at HWCs are also being ramped up. Detection, referral of severe mental disorders, follow-up meds, counseling, suicide risk assessment, even comprehensive plans for dementia. That's quite thorough. It is. And when we talk about prevention, the strategy is multi-tiered. Mm -hmm. Very thoughtful. Okay, break that down. Primary prevention. Primary prevention focuses on promoting healthy lifestyles. So balanced nutrition, appropriate portion sizes. Less calories, more fiber. Right. Increased fiber, green leafy veg, fruits, regular exercise, no smoking or alcohol. Basic but crucial stuff. And immunizations. Crucially, yes. Mm -hmm. Immunizations against bacterial pneumonia and influenza, which can be life-saving for older adults. Okay, that's primary. Secondary? Secondary prevention involves screening, catching things early, screening for high blood pressure, diabetes, certain cancers like colorectal, breast, cervical. Early detection saves lives. Absolutely. And finally, tertiary prevention. Which focuses on? Rehabilitation for independent living, resettlement, things like physiotherapy, counseling, empowering caregivers. There's accident prevention. Yes, vital accident prevention measures, ensuring good lighting, installing railed passages in homes, practical things. You know, and if you look at the larger goal here, these multi-tiered prevention strategies, it's all about not just extending lifespan, but enhancing health span. Quality of life, not just quantity. Exactly. Ensuring those added years are lived with greater dignity, independence, and quality. This focus on prevention across different levels is really key to managing that double burden effectively, proactively. Makes sense. 
Now, all these remarkable efforts, they must be underpinned by significant financial commitment. And supported by voluntary organizations too, right? Both. The National Health Policy 2017 aims to increase government health spending to 2.5% of GDP by 2025. A significant target. And reduce catastrophic health expenditure faced by households by a quarter, also by 2025. Reducing that financial burden on families? Shows a clear national intent to invest in population health, especially the elderly, and alleviate that strain. And the voluntary sector. It's not just government. We see the crucial role of voluntary organizations like Help Edge India. Doing great work on the ground. Providing invaluable, tangible support. Free cataract operations, mobile Medicare units, bringing health care to remote areas, old age homes. They truly complement government efforts. You know, from a broader perspective, these significant financial allocations the robust support from voluntary orgs, they're absolutely essential. The scaffolding, as you said. Exactly. They enable the entire multi-pronged strategy to stand strong. Yeah. Without this level of commitment from the state and civil society, truly enhancing both the quality and quantity of those remaining years would be, well, much harder, if not impossible. It really is a testament to a comprehensive approach. So what does this all mean for you as we wrap up this deep dive? Bring it all together. We've seen how India is confronting this monumental demographic shift with a really comprehensive and integrated approach. From policy to grassroots action. Moving from foundational policies and financial security right down to grassroots health services delivered by HWCs and that proactive prevention piece. It's a truly multifaceted response to a multifaceted challenge. It really demonstrates a profound national commitment to its aging citizens and offers, I think, powerful insights into how a developing nation can tackle complex health issues head on. Which raises an important final question, perhaps. Go for it. Considering India's unique double burden of disease balancing infectious and chronic conditions and its incredibly multi-pronged strategies, what broader lessons can other nations draw from this? Whether they're facing their own aging population. Or resource constraints or similar dual health crises. What can they learn from India's extensive effort to care for its elderly? It's a really compelling model for global consideration, I think. A really interesting question to ponder. Thank you for joining us for this deep dive. Thank you. Until next time, keep digging, keep learning.